Hello, I'm Sarah Angel. I am the executive director and the publisher at the Art Canada Institute. It is my great honor to be here today with the artist Kent Monkman. Hello, Kent. Hello. And um, to be sitting at a socially distanced six feet away from you. Thank you for accommodating me. And uh, particularly, thank you for accommodating me the day after such great news broke that uh, that your paintings that you did for the Metropolitan Museum have been acquired by the museum. So I know you're really busy today and I'm, I'm grateful that you made the time. Um, we're here doing an exclusive interview for Art Toronto about the publication Revision and Resistance um, that was made in conjunction and alongside the time that the paintings were being created. So how are you feeling just before we start? I had, well, it's great. It feels amazing to wake up and see news feeds uh, being, you know, people texting me and emailing me and being excited to see the, 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 the announcement in the news. Um, it was uh, something that was, you know, took many months to kind of uh, finally um, go through, but we're, I'm just super thrilled to be part of the Met Collection. It was a really wonderful project to do with them and uh, it's thrilling to, to have my work belong in the collection of the Met. Congratulations. Thank it's you. an incredible accomplishment for you, for Canadian art, for the world. And, and um, it's a segue into this project, which we're going to talk about. And it is the book, Revision and Resistance. And it's a book about Kent's two paintings. And in some ways, I, th I feel, Kent, that the, the book has been um, eclipsed by COVID because it was released at the end of March. Um, but one of the reasons that the book came into existence was because of your very strong feeling about the importance of art books. Mm -hmm. And so before we get into this book, can you tell me about the role that art books have played in your life and in your practice um, and, and why it was so important for you to see a catalog that was done on the Metropolitan Museum paintings? Well, I think any artist will appreciate having a book to uh, solidify their project into art history. You know, I, for many, many years, I had no catalogs, almost nothing published about, about the different projects that I was doing. It was always so frustrating because, you know, for, for, for a Canadian institution to have that extra bit of money set aside for a book was so rare that artists like myself, you know, would often just never have books published uh, about the projects. And so it was very frustrating because you would do, put all that effort into the exhibition and then it would have no, there'd be no legacy. There would be no life beyond that brief period of time that the, the work was installed. So when you finally get these occasional books, they're always treasured because that means that it will go into art history and there'll be a memory of it, an imprint, and, and it'll be part of the legacy of the project. And um, so whenever... I, in those few instances where I was able to have a book published, it was really um, incredible and very much appreciated. So um, I knew that the Met wasn't going to be publishing anything. And so when we spoke about it and you were so open to, to producing this book, it was really exciting for me. And you did such a beautiful job. I mean, this book is fantastic. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah, I, I absolutely love this book. I'm very proud of this book. And um, it's rare to get to get a, to get a book um, published for for your exhibition or your project. So I think I just very much value the getting a catalog or an art book. And and for the viewers, I should explain that the reason that the Art Canada Institute became the publisher for the book about Kent's Metropolitan Museum Commission is that the project was such a short time span in terms of you creating the paintings that the Metropolitan Museum, although it's a mighty museum, didn't have the flexibility to do a publication in a short period of time. So we began collaborating on this project. Um, it was about August of 2019, is that correct? And then, and then it was complete by um, end of February of, of 2020. Yes, yeah, so it was very fast. And one of the things that was very important is that there would also be a documentation of the works in the Metropolitan Museum. So the idea was that um, the book would be available while the paintings were still up. And now, because of the global pandemic, the paintings are still up. The book has now been released. And, um, and so, Kent, tell me a bit about the cover and how it ties into 
the entire project. So I think the uh, the design is really brilliant because um, this cutout that you see here, this paper uh, cutout, is that what you call it, a cutout? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, the image behind is Miss Chief and, and it takes inspiration from uh, Washington crossing the Delaware, which is a significant, massive history painting in the Met and, and you know everyone knows that painting. Um, and so I was actually riffing on that painting. It's one of my sources of inspiration. So. It, 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 the cutout shows, uh, you know, the image of Miss Chief in, in one of the paintings, and I thought it was a, a really um, smart way to talk about how uh, I took inspiration from, you know, that painting and how I was able to subvert it and to challenge the museum and kind of go into their collection and look at these works um, created by a settler artists uh, that really glorified colonialism. And you know, this project was really about challenging the museum to look at their collection differently, to have the audience at the Met look at their collection differently, and to um, really put forward a perspective uh, on this shared history of the continent from you know, a Cree perspective. And uh, so I just thought that the book did a really beautiful job of just like creating a cover that is like uh, you know, very, very beautiful design, but also um, just makes you want to open it and, and see more. And so, so this cutout is the figure of George Washington. And then underneath is an aspect of this here that's Kent's alter ego. And then um, one of the things that we did was the back of the book, we have a reference to that George Washington painting. Mm -hmm. And then to Kent. So I thought it was, um, and I and I should say that while the Art Canada Institute was a publisher for the book, the designer was an incredible studio in Toronto called Underline Design, and and they really came up with this idea for the cover of um, how do we both acknowledge Kent's art, but also reference what you are doing in those paintings, mm -hmm. and that you are revisiting the art, you are. Um, engaging with the museum and that you are in in the process of an act of decolonization and maybe for those who are listening but don't know the paintings as well can you tell us in a in a really brief way um, the idea behind the two paintings and and what they're about sure so the commission um, was to uh, ask me to engage with the Great Hall so I had this opportunity to create works for the Great Hall. And uh, the two spaces I, I was offered were the, the, the north and south end uh, walls. And so, um, because the Great Hall itself is this place of uh, entering, uh, entrances and departures, comings and goings, uh, it really got me thinking about New York as this portal for immigration. And um, just the larger story of, uh, you know, settler cultures coming to North America, displacing the first people, and um, so it really fit thematically with the space itself. And the, so the two paintings, Mr. Gosawak, uh, the wooden boat people, Mr. Gosawak, um, being a Cree word, was originally used to you know, refer to the French people, um, but uh, ultimately it was really to speak about the Europeans as you know, people arriving in boats. And so um, I knew that water and boats would be part of this. I mean, so many populations around the world are being displaced um, for different political reasons, but also climate change is displacing people and people are moving you know, about in boats. And in the future, rising sea water will displace more populations. Um, but part of this project was really to engage with the, the Met's collection and so as I went through the collection, of course, I've known the collection really well for many years. And there are sculptures and paintings made by settler artists and European artists in the 19th century that were depictions of indigenous people. So I wanted to address those and the problems of some of those um, depictions being, you know, really through a very subjective romantic lens. And so um, I was able to incorporate those references into the paintings and to talk about um, the shared histories uh, that we have here on this continent over the past five, 600 years of um, being in contact with each other. And it's a very complex history. And so I tried to achieve some kind of that conversation with these two paintings. And so there's a left painting in which Miss Chief is welcoming, it's called Welcoming the Newcomers, and she's welcoming essentially uh, refugees uh, who've arrived in a boat that has uh, you know, kind of capsized. 
In the second painting, um, Mischief is kind of leading a, a, a boat full of her own people and helping other people um, to an uncertain future. As you know, we see a very small piece of land left that's being defended by white militants. So there's quite a few things going on in the two paintings, different themes that I'm addressing, but um, ultimately it was an opportunity to make two very large paintings that would hold the space of the Great Hall. And uh, I, I don't think that uh, it was actually kind of the perfect time to take on a project like this because my studio practice has evolved over the years and I have a team that um, when the Met came and said, you know, here is a project, you've got eight months to achieve it. Uh, we were able to take on that project and execute it in a relatively short period of time. So for me, it was an incredible uh, achievement in terms of what my studio was capable of in a relatively short period of time. And to see those paintings kind of go up in the Great Hall was really a, a profound and exciting moment as, you know, as an artist uh, to see your work uh, displayed in, in the Great Hall. And OK, so another question to do with the paintings. Your alter ego, is that correct, mm -hmm. uh, Miss Chief? is at the center of both. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a bit about that alter ego, the name, the character? It's detailed in the book, but mm -hmm. I want to hear it from you. Yeah, for sure. So Mischief I created uh, many years ago as a way to reverse the gaze. You know, when I was looking at the art of George Catlin and Paul Kane and, and Edward Curtis and really challenging and, and investigating the subjectivity of their work. Why were they making their work? What were their goals in achieving their, their bodies of work? Um, but I knew I needed to have an, an artistic persona that could live inside my own paintings and kind of look back at the settler, look back at the settler artist. And I wanted a strong persona that could also really uh, present an empowered understanding of indigenous uh, understanding of gender and sexuality. So Mischief became this kind of uh, legendary being and her backstory evolved over the years and it's been sort of more fleshed out more recently in, in a, a memoir project that I'm writing with Giselle Gordon. And to understand that character, we've kind of went back to um, Cree uh, cosmology, Cree thinking about you know, Cree values and how we see the world. And so Mischief kind of fits in this parallel universe with the other legendary beings. And um, so in these paintings, you know, she really represents uh, a Cree worldview. And she is a time traveler who yeah. moves throughout history, uh, almost intervening and bettering the, the world, um, somewhat with a superhero type mm -hmm. powers. Uh, one of the things that I think is fantastic about the book is that um, in addition to having a lot of phenomenal images of your art, is that you allowed us to sort of go behind the curtain mm -hmm. into the studio document with photographs the creation of the works. You were, you were very, very open, I think um, perhaps more open than most artists in allowing photographs to be taken of the models, of the process, etc. What makes you feel so comfortable in revealing the, the behind the curtains component of your art? Well, I think my practice is so unique that um, I, I felt like it is uh, something that, um, you know, Painters, as soon as there was a photograph, as soon as there was a camera, painters were turning to photography. And for many years, I, I thought that that was cheating, you know, working with photography as a tool to achieve uh, a painting. Um, but uh, one of the things that happened in my studios with, you know, in collaboration with my assistants is we, we realized that we were going to have, make, we'd be able to make better paintings if we had better source material for my paintings to work with, painters to work with. So for many years I was doing the sketching and doing the studies myself, but then there was this gap between translating a very loose kind of sketch or study to a larger work of art. How do they translate and extrapolate, you know, the information? So uh, we returned to the roots of, you know, uh, painters like Delacroix who, you know, used photographs and um, instead of resisting that, that, that tool, um, took advantage of uh, the possibility of working with models and costuming uh, perfecting our, our, our lighting, uh, perfecting our casting, really looking towards uh, maximizing how we can collaborate with models to get better source images, digital images that my painters can then turn into uh, paintings. And there is an alchemy in making paintings and there is this magic that happens. And even though I'm sharing the process, you know, what happens is ultimately the sum of many talented people that come together in this project. And for me, uh, my, my, one of my main goals is to um, create an environment that is uh, 
a collaborative environment and that is generous, so that we are generous with each other, that we share information and knowledge with each other about our techniques. And I feel like that's just a value that I hold as an artist is to be generous and to share those things. Because even if people figure out how I can make the paintings, well, they can then take that and go and make their own paintings, but they'll never something. be Kent Monkman paintings. That's and right, so that is something extraordinary on their own. There's it? something yeah. extraordinary on their own and all the power to them. For me, this is about also creating an environment where people can just make fantastic and amazing paintings. And the more that you know, we can share that with others, the better it is. And my painters are becoming such incredible painters mm -hmm. and, and artists in their own right. And um, you know, they're, they're in an opportunity in an environment where they can learn not just from me, but from each other. And so we have very specific techniques about how we create the works. Um, this is the way that I like to make paintings. And these are the kind of paintings that I like to make. But, you know, they might have very different approaches in their own practice. But I think um, it's just about sharing. And I think that's, that's an important value in my life is to be generous and to share. Well, it's, it's great because you share it in the book by having sketches, sketches of the first uh, drawings for, for the paintings, um, photographs of the models that you you assembled and staged to then go on and do the paintings. Um, so what what is unique? And then you have a wonderful writer named Jamie Powell, who's a Dartmouth based curator. Um, she she does a, a great Q and A with you about the process. But what's so interesting is that in addition to having the very contemporary approach, Sasha Suda, who's the director of the National Gallery of Canada. She wrote an essay about the connection between your art and 17th century art. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a completely different conversation that comes in to the documentation of your work. And then I think ultimately addresses what you talked about at the beginning of the conversation, which is that um, painting the work is one part. But I think in many ways, the book is the the legacy mm -hmm. of the project and and how art historians will look at it and sasha suda is, is such a fine art historian herself did a wonderful show on rubens tell me a bit about why you felt it was important to have a connection in the book to writing about the old masters well i think i take a lot of my cues uh, from the old masters in terms of the atelier system you know, I remember walking through the Louvre many, many years ago and seeing the Rubens uh, suite of paintings for Catherine de Medici and just puzzling over how an artist could possibly make that many paintings in a three or four year period. Well, of course, he had a, he had a team of assistants that helped him. But even so, even understanding, you need to under, figure out yourself how to work with assistants and how is that even possible um, and have them all have this uniform feeling and consistency to their, to their uh, finishing. And so um, no one told me how to set up my, my studio in this atelier uh, way. But for me, it was really important because I, to have this connection made to, to artists like Rubens, because we are, I'm basically following in a tradition of making paintings in a similar fashion. And I think, again, that, that is uh, something that um, some artists, uh, you know, have been led to believe that, you know, you have to be solitary, you have to be tortured and, and just be on your own in your own studio, making your work by yourself. Then unless you make every stroke uh, of paint yourself, it's not your own. And, and I don't believe that because artists have proven that, that that's completely wrong. Uh, and they learned, their assistants learned from them how to make work. And it's a way of learning as much as it is a, a way of being able to, to make better work and more work. And I learn from my own painters. And you know, if you create an, an, an environment like that, it's, it's, it's a learning environment where people uh, learn from each other. But the connection to the uh, atelier system uh, was uh, a way to connect my work to art history because so much of my inspiration comes from art history. Now, a, a third component of the book is, I believe, the essay that is done by Nick Estes, which, mm -hmm. is, which is one of the most powerful pieces of writing um, that I have ever read. I, I was able to get to know him through your introduction. Um, and what Nick Estes writes about is the importance of um, a Cree artist painting works in the Metropolitan Museum, for the Metropolitan Museum at this moment in history. Now, history has changed somewhat since, since the paintings were unveiled in December. Um, but can you tell us why Nick Estes and that voice, that piece of scholarship, is particularly important to documenting this body of work? 
Well, you know, I, I referenced European art making, the tradition of, of, of Western art, but it's really important that through that, you know, as I take those influences, I'm transforming them into indigenous expression. And Nick, uh, you know, an indigenous scholar, is, uh, you know, basically positioning my work into um, a, a, um, a movement of activism where indigenous people are having to resist uh, the colonial um, projects um, to have to strengthen our voices to 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 challenge and question the colonial institutions version of our own history and I admire Nick so much for his writing but also for his activism and um, for me as an artist that's been one of the most important parts of my work is to be, have, be a strong voice um, to challenge and question the colonial project that continues to have this this enduring impact on our communities, on our families. And so that, that activism part is really, really critical to my work. It, it is for me what also makes the book a really interesting book because um, it is part an art historical documentation. It is part a look at your methodology. Um, it is part a manifesto. But something that was very interesting about working with you is that when I said, Ken, how about you writing an essay for this. You were a bit like, I'm going to be hands <laughs> off there. And, um, and, and I want to leave some mystery or something mm -hmm. for others to talk about. Tell me about, about um, not writing for the book. Well, I, you know, I, I, I've tried to, I, some, I do minimal writing sometimes just to give people keys to unlock some of the themes that I'm trying to address. But um, I think it's it's important as an artist. I mean, the paintings, that is my language. That's my vocabulary. That's my Fair chosen enough. form of communication. And I, I, I just feel like that's where I am more articulate. And I feel like um, all of the, the intricacies, the subtleties in a painting are, are difficult for me to even um, find words to talk about uh, in, in a way that would possibly detract from the image in itself. And, I, I feel that the paintings have to be left with, with questions. And in many ways, that's what I am doing as an artist. I'm asking questions and, and I, I, I give people little clues to connect some of the dots sometimes, but ultimately you don't wanna explain your work. And, and there is a danger with making representational work sometimes that people think that it can all be sewn up and there is just one way to interpret the work. In fact, it's a little dangerous that you make representational images because they can be taken on a literal level. And that happens sometimes. Uh, and um, you know, when you use allegory and you talk about uh, to talk about um, more complex ideas, sometimes that goes over people's heads, and 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 you just have to take the risk that that will happen. But um, you know, I'm committed to this language of painting because this form of representational painting to me just has so much potential to hold narrative, to express emotion to uh, talk about complex ideas and themes that um, are not possible in other language, uh, visual vocabularies. And for me, it's, it's really significant that it's rooted in this, this tradition of painting that's many, many hundreds of years old. And I'm making it my own as a Cree person. In fact, I'm making, taking this language of, of painting and making it into a, a Cree form of expression. And how would you feel when you read parts in the book, in the drafts, uh, before the book was published? And you were like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't see that in my yeah. work. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of stepping back as a, as a writer is that you're, you're, you're allowing others to interpret the work. You're allowing them to bring their own ideas to it. And you encourage that. And even if that wasn't necessarily your own intention, I think it expands what, what the, how the paintings can be interpreted. And, um, you know, as these paintings continue to live in the Met collection, you know, years from now, people will look at them and, and find their own way of interpreting them. And I think that's, that's amazing. I want to uh, point to one component of the book, which is this, uh, the, these very interesting indexes that, uh, that were created. And they're, they're guides of sorts to the paintings. And they're a book within a book. And, um, and here we're looking at uh, works by Rubens, uh, classical sculptor. Um, these were all works that you, when you began the process, you looked at works in the Metropolitan Museum um, and, 
And what you do here is it's not, this is, again, it's not your writing. It's actually, it, it's just descriptions of the works. And then it's really up to the reader of the book to use this as a key mm -hmm. of sorts to understanding the paintings. Um, but tell us about this component and these works that you see here. I think there are about over uh, 40 that you looked at. Mm -hmm. um, here, a great one by Courbet. Um, yeah, and it's sort of like an art history. Mm -hmm within an art history. Well, I think the index is great because again, it gives people clues to my inspiration. And this is what I love to do is to look at many different sources and kind of stitch them all together to tell a new story. And for me, art is exactly that. It is about transformation. I mean, these are uh, works of art by, by artists, uh, you know, European artists who wouldn't have known each other and, uh, you know, were creating images in their time, uh, images of, of indigenous people. Um, but there are also works in there by, by Rubens uh, that are, you know, paintings of uh, Venus and Adonis. And, um, but that's, that's how I like to work. I like to sort of, you know, extrapolate influences from many different sources. So the indexes are great because it give, gives people clues to how I took all of those uh, sources and transformed them and made them into these two new paintings. And for me, that really is uh, what my practice is about. It's about transforming, looking at, um, sometimes difficult subjects, hard subjects, and transforming those uh, into positive messages or messages that challenge and transcend. And I should say that the essay in the book by Mark Phillips and Ruth Phillips very much addresses that subject of mm -hmm. transforming art history mm -hmm. into other things. Um, I now want to talk a bit about the special edition that we did for this project. Um, there's a long history um, within the visual arts of artists making what are called artist books, um, essentially works of art unto themselves. And, um, and so this is a special edition version of Revision and Resistance. Um, I don't know if anybody can see, but that's a, a beautiful uh, emboss of, of mischief. And then getting inside of the book, um, we created 30 of these, and the really special thing is that there are two works of art that are enclosed in it, and I'm going to open it. Tell us about these two works. So these are uh, copper plate etchings that are hand painted uh, with watercolor um, to make each one of them unique. It's a small edition of 30. And each one of these uh, images uh, depict kind of a central, uh, the central image of mischief in the two paintings. And, you know, copper plate etching and engraving is, has been for, again, hundreds of years part of that process of painters being able to disseminate their, their painted images to a wider audience through reproductions. And I love this technique uh, because, it, again, it's kind of classical in nature. Um, you know, I scribed myself the, the images into a, a copper plate, which was then etched and then printed on, on this paper and then painted with watercolor and added the color um, to each one of these. So that makes them unique and special in this small edition. And um, I, 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 I like to work in this, in this medium. Um, and it's, uh, I've done this a number of times. So this relates very much to my own practice. And it makes the book this special edition of the book more special because you've got these two kind of original works of art. It, it is pretty extraordinary because there really are only two paintings. They're the, mm -hmm. or, you know, one of each component of the diptych. And then this was an opportunity for you to create 30 unique works that are related to that, um, but only these 30 that exist. And then how did you pick the subject matter for each? Well, I think with this, it was pretty clear that we just wanted to focus on the hero of the two paintings, Miss Chief, and just kind of zoom in on those little details. So um, it was just finding the right cropping and sizing them so that they would feel like they belonged kind of in conversation with each other, the right and the left painting. I have a, a last question for you, which is that so much has changed since the, the, the paintings have been unveiled. and. Now, living in a time of the pandemic, have you had a, a developed a new relationship with the works and do you feel that there's a new meaning 
um, and, and any way to understand them differently? Or do you feel like the meaning has been enhanced in terms of what you were in, initially set out to do? Well, I think there's something, um, there was always something kind of ominous about, uh, about both paintings because they both really inferred um, an imminent change occurring. In welcoming the newcomers, there was this wave, this tsunami of settlers kind of clamoring onto the shore. And as, as we know, at that time, that also represented the coming of epidemics and, and disease and that affected and essentially wiped out millions of indigenous people. The second painting, Resurgence of the People, also infers a, a kind of um, uh, a bit of foreboding of, of, of the future with the rising seawater and how that will shift uh, human existence in the future. So I think both of them are sort of um, have that component of, um, of danger uh, that we as, a hu as human beings face uh, as we look to the future. And um, for me, this was an opportunity to really think about as a Cree person, how do, how do Cree teachings teach me and other Cree people how to deal with the future, to deal with the present, how to think about how we move forward in the future? I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I look at the paintings, I think there is a, a sense of ominousness about them, a sense of foreboding, but ultimately a message of, mm -hmm. of hopefulness mm -hmm. and change. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they are so prescient and the scholarship that was done for the book is something that is so important for the times we are living in right now. And so I thank you for the opportunity to be able to work with you on them. And I thank you for creating them and for, for talking to me today. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for creating a, just a, a beautiful publication that um, I am so proud of and that I am very happy that it will continue the legacy of this exhibition on well into the future. Thank you. Thank you.